Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser of Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Every day, we plug into the biggest powerhouse in this galaxy, <laughs> the sun rises. Our sun is just a very, very big hydrogen bomb. Both uses hydrogen fusion to release energy. The sun is a million, billion, zillion, gazillion ton hydrogen explosive, whereas one of our anthropogenic hydrogen bombs has a few kilograms of hydrogen. Because of this, its blast lasts only a few minutes. But the sun blast lasts for about 10 billion years, out of which 5 billion have already passed away. It is the incidence of this powerhouse and our earthly proximity to it that we have photonic energy delivered here. We discover how it passes through our atmosphere, drives water to transition between solid, liquid, and gas, as we find it throughout the oceans as a liquid, and sits as solid ice and of course in the atmosphere as a gas, solid and liquid. The transition between these climatological states is best related to the climates we know, changing with the months of the year. We know these as seasons, and so do plants thriving and surviving there. Plants are the primary producers, and they support the herbivores who feed on them. All organisms react to the climate where they live. We may call it weather, but we really look for the climate to find the zones of preferred habitability. We will explore how sunlight delivers photonic energy through the atmosphere, how it initiates clouds, and the role clouds serve to filter sunlight energy. Reflect it, dissolve it, and capture some. Those captured photonic energy packets are held in cloud-borne moisture where persistent energy transfer is enacted. When it rains, energy pours. The sun's energy feeds plants which convert sunlight into energy used for growth. Places near the equator experience little seasonal variation. They have about the same amount of daylight and darkness throughout the year. These places remain warm year-round. Near the equator, regions typically have alternating rainy and dry seasons. Precipitation, wherever it falls, is warmed by the sun as it rides in the clouds. At the equator, warming happens when it falls to the earth. After rainfall, the sun is exposed and it warms again. Evaporation transfers heat from the surface water into layers of the atmosphere. Polar regions experience seasonal temperature variation, although they are generally colder than other places on earth. Near the poles, the amount of daylight changes dramatically between summer and winter. In Barrow, Alaska, the northernmost city in the USA, it stays light all day long between mid-May and early August. The city is in total darkness between mid-November and January. Nevertheless, even in these extreme outliers, solar energy still drives all physical and biological cycles, even when sunlight is not seen directly. The processes of balance is seen throughout shared interactions. Earth is not on a perpendicular orbit to the sun. This tilt makes latitude into an important measure. It gives meaning to how the sun rays hit the Earth. This demonstrates the uneven distribution of isolation occurring across the face of the Earth. Equatorial regions intercept the highest amount, while the poles receive the least. Why? It is because of the Earth's spherical shape. Towards the poles, while the Earth is tilted, the sun's rays are spread over a larger area and take a longer path through the atmosphere. Near the equator, the sun's rays strike the Earth's surface perpendicularly. Thus, they are concentrated into a smaller area than at the poles. I slid in a red star to show where Pullman is located, and you can see how the amount of solar radiation changes throughout the year. We know that we have seasons, especially the further we are from the equator. To get a clearer feel for the reasons for the seasons, I bring in the California Academy of Sciences to take us on a flight through the galaxy. You know that Earth orbits the sun, right? And that it takes a full year for our planet to complete its orbit? Earth also rotates like a slightly tilted spinning top. Earth remains tilted in the same direction all year round as we orbit the sun. 
But that means the sun's light shines differently on Earth at different times of the year. Let's look at Earth when it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Observe how the North Pole tips away from the sun. This means that sunlight strikes the Northern Hemisphere at a shallow angle for a short period of time. This is why winter weather is generally cool with short days and long nights. As Earth orbits the sun, we move towards spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Now Earth is tilted neither toward nor away from the sun, as day and night are about equal in length. As we make our way to the summer months, notice that Earth is still tilted in the same direction, only now on the other side of our orbit. The North Pole is tipping toward the sun. Sunlight strikes the northern hemisphere more directly, and the sun stays in the sky for a longer time. Compared to winter, summer days are warmer, and the sun stays in the sky much longer. Notice, too, that while it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the southern hemisphere. Because of Earth's tilt, the seasons are reversed. We observed how Earth's tilt creates the different seasons throughout the year. How does this affect life? Plant life and other photosynthesizers, we call them primary producers, depend on sunlight. They respond to the changes in the seasons. Earth-orbiting satellites measure the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by these primary producers. Bright regions on this map show where they devour the most carbon dioxide, turning light from the sun into oxygen and natural sugars. In spring, when sunshine strikes the cold waters of the North Pacific, productivity skyrockets. Phytoplankton and other microscopic photosynthesizers form the base of the ocean food web and all ocean life responds to changes in the seasons. On land, forests grow green during the spring, brightening the continents. During winter, continents in this view turn dark from a lack of photosynthesis. The atmosphere is the exosphere, thermosphere, mesosphere, stratosphere, and troposphere. While we have areas where these are found, there are no signposts telling us where the on-ramps are. These are stacked like soft mattresses that compress and expand in response to temperature and pressure. The word atmosphere comes from modern Greek for atmos, meaning vapor, and sapharia, meaning sphere. It is a layer or set of layers of gases surrounding our planet, held in place by gravity. Earth's atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and many other gases, as well as particles of liquids and solids. Earth's atmosphere makes conditions on Earth suitable for all living things. The most abundant gas in Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. And the second most abundant gas is oxygen. The amount of water vapor within the atmosphere is highly variable. Critically, the atmosphere is a filtering mecca that solar radiation needs to pass through. As it does, energy warms the gases it strikes, including water vapor. We know that water constricts and expands in response to temperature, and it does this in the troposphere. This is where clouds are made and barometric pressures changes. Hmm, we are coming back to this image in a bit looking closely at the division between the troposphere and stratosphere. The troposphere is where cloud action strikes. We need to take a closer look at the components of the Earth's systems. We are in full contact with the troposphere. This is where biotic life happens. Cryosphere is the water in its solid form, ice and snow including glaciers. One part of the cryosphere is ice that is found in water, including frozen parts of the ocean, such as waters surrounding Antarctica and the frozen Arctic. The cryosphere includes sea ice, lake ice, river ice, snow cover, <laughs> glaciers, ice caps, ice sheets, and frozen water in the ground. Thus, there is a wide overlap with the hydrosphere, which is the same water, but there it is in liquid form. 
Lithosphere is the Earth's crust plus the upper mantle. We looked at this as we began this journey, tubing with plate tectonics. The word lithosphere comes from ancient Greek with lithos meaning rocky and sapphire for sphere. The lithosphere is the outermost sphere of the solid Earth, consisting of the crust and the upper part of the mantle, defined by its rigid mechanical properties. The biosphere is the biotic and abiotic components of the planet. In ecology, we dedicate a lot of attention to this part of the globe. It is the regions of the surface, atmosphere, and hydrosphere of the Earth, occupied by living organisms. Hey, this is where we live. The biosphere comes from the Greek bios, meaning life, and safaria for sphere. It is the layer of the planet Earth where life exists. The biosphere is one of the four layers that surrounds the Earth along with lithosphere, rock, hydrosphere, water, and atmosphere, air. It is the sum of the ecosystems. Hydrosphere is expressed by the water cycle. Water in all places and in all three forms as solid, liquid, and gas. It is all the waters of the Earth's surface, such as lakes and seas, and sometimes including water over the Earth's surface, such as clouds. The hydrosphere includes water that is on the surface of the planet, underground, and in the air. The major importance of hydrosphere is that water sustains various life forms and plays an important role in ecosystems and regulation of the atmosphere. Water vapor is most visible as clouds and fog. We know the players, but we interact on a moving vessel. Our planet spins. We saw that. But movement of attached and unattached players needs to be considered. The Coriolis effect is seen when a mass, moving in a rotating system, experiences a force acting perpendicular to the direction of motion and to the axis of rotation. On Earth, the effect tends to defect moving objects to the right, or easterly, in the northern hemisphere, and to the left, or westerly, in the southern. This is important in the formation of cyclonic weather systems. The atmosphere is not nailed to the planet. It is as simple as the ball thrown from the spinning sphere. The thrower is attached to the spinning base, like being fixed to the Earth, and the ball converts force energy into movement. From the perspective of the ball, its path is straight and true. But to us, fixed to the base, the ball and the weather systems divert to the left. This is the Coriolis effect. Earth's atmosphere responds much the same. Earth's atmospheric pressure is often determined by wind and weather patterns around the globe. Gravity exerts a pull on the planet's atmosphere, just as it keeps us tethered to its surface. This gravitational force causes the atmosphere to push against everything it surrounds, the pressure rising and falling as Earth turns. Atmospheric or air pressure is the force per unit of area exerted on Earth's surface by the weight of the air above. The force exerted by an air mass is created by molecules that make it up and their size, motion, and number present above. These factors are important because they determine the temperature and density of the air and thus its pressure. The number of air molecules above a surface determines air pressure. As the number of molecules increases, they exert more pressure on the surface, and the total atmospheric pressure increases. By contrast, if the number of molecules decreases, so too does the air pressure. Winds blow across the Earth's surface throughout the atmosphere surrounding us. We know that the atmosphere is essential to life on Earth. The components of air, particularly oxygen and carbon dioxide, play a critical role in the chemistry of life. Another important aspect of air is atmospheric pressure. We live at the bottom of an ocean of air. Gravity pulls on this massive layer of gas, creating pressure. The pressure is greatest at the bottom. Earth's surface, the level where we live, has the highest amount of air pressure of all. Distinct zones of climatic conditions are expressed as a function of distance from the equator. We measure it as latitude. These zones are the product of several interacting factors. In the Northern Hemisphere, three large atmospheric cells of air circulate in the atmosphere. 
The circulating air within each atmospheric cell makes the characteristic winds that flow in the distinct patterns as illustrated by the black and red arrows in this diagram. The paths of circulation are driven by rotation of the Earth and the incoming energy from the Sun. This creates atmospheric pressure systems, which create pressure gradients along which the winds flow. It is this air circulation that helps transport energy and heat from the equator to the poles. Oftentimes, the difference between weather and climate is a measure of time. Weather is what conditions of the atmosphere are over a short period of time, and climate is how the atmosphere behaves over relatively long periods. It is a subjective measure of the environment. From this, we begin to understand what weather means. Weather is basically the way the atmosphere is behaving mainly with respect to its effects upon life and human activities. The difference between weather and climate is that weather consists of the short-term changes in the atmosphere, minutes to days. Most people think of weather in terms of temperature, humidity, precipitation, cloudiness, brightness, visibility, wind, and the atmospheric pressures, as in high and low pressure. <laughs> Those are a lot of considerations to pack into a seven-letter word. When we understand the meaning of weather, we open the door to grasping what climate means. In short, uh, climate is the description of the long-term pattern of weather in a particular area. Some scientists define climate as the average weather for a particular region and time period, usually taken over 30 or more years in sequence. It's really an average pattern of weather for the region you are dealing with. As we pilot this ship, we need to tour the engine house. This takes us back to the sun. Solar energy is radiant light and heat that is anthropogenically harnessed using a range of ever-evolving technologies such as solar heating, photovoltaics, solar thermal energy, solar architecture, molten salt power plants, and artificial photosynthesis. You heard that one, right? Photosynthesis. Plants did it first. Consider energy flow throughout this big blue marble to understand how some is intercepted by the hydrosphere, some by the lithosphere, and some in the atmosphere. Energy capture at each level impacts the relation and transfer to adjacent sinks. Their energy flow interactions create climate. This combination makes the clouds grow, heat, cool, and the winds blow. Differential energy absorption is the powerhouse of environmental activity. Consider the hydrosphere as an energy sink. The Earth's ocean cover about 71% of Earth's surface and contains 97% of Earth's water. Ocean stored energies control weather and climate by dominating Earth's energy and water systems by absorbing, storing, and moving energy and water. The ocean absorbs much of the solar radiation reaching the Earth, and because of the high heat capacity of water, they are the largest heat sinks on Earth. The ocean loses heat by evaporation. When this water vapor condenses and forms precipitation, latent heat is released into the atmosphere. This energy drives atmospheric circulation. Most precipitation that falls on land originally evaporated from the tropical ocean basins. The ocean dominates Earth's hydrological cycle. Oceans and oceanic life are major controllers of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the Earth's carbon cycle. The Earth's energy budget accounts for the balance between the energy the Earth receives from the sun and the energy the Earth radiates back into outer space after having been distributed throughout our climatic system and having thus powered Earth's so-called heat engine. The exact values for energy flows in the Earth system vary according to different estimates. All estimates have some uncertainty. The flow of incoming and outgoing energy is Earth's energy budget. For Earth's temperature to be stable over long periods of time, incoming energy and outgoing energy have to be equal. In other words, the energy budget at the top of the atmosphere must balance. About 23% of the solar energy that arrives at the top of the atmosphere is reflected back to space by clouds. Atmospheric particles, or bright ground surfaces like sea ice and snow, this energy plays no role in Earth's climate system. 
About 19% of incoming solar energy is absorbed in the atmosphere by water vapor, dust, and ozone. About 49% passes through the atmosphere and is absorbed by the Earth's surface. Thus, about 68% of the total incoming solar energy is absorbed by Earth systems. This is our budgetary energy system. Clouds play an important role in both warming and cooling our planet. Clouds give us a cooler climate on Earth than we would enjoy without clouds. We take a flyover, floating above the clouds. In this case, it appears to be cumulonimbus clouds, forming in the mid-troposphere. These puffy clouds appear to have some vertical structure, flat on the bottom. So it's not raining yet. <laughs> on this scene, we see some openings and shadows are made because of this cloud structure. As we look at scenes like this one, consider what happens when a cloud intercepts direct solar radiation. The cloud is heated and the Earth's surface is not. Shadows do not cool the Earth's surface. They intercept the solar radiation that would have heated the land. The absence of heating is not cooling. Now, let's take a stroll through this scene. At point A, clouds intercept and reflect solar radiation by reflecting incoming sunlight back to space. Solar energy is not transferred to the surface. Hmm, up to B. Solar energy is reflected by clouds back to the upper levels of the atmosphere and into space. Surface heating does not occur. Slide over to C, which is pretty much the same cloud surface, but now consider how the cloud was heated as it reflected sunlight energy. In this case, some amount of thermal energy is absorbed by cloud elements, humidity. Re-radiation to space does not heat the surface. Wow, now to the bottom side of this cloud at D. Precipitation warms atmosphere by release of heat as rain. This cools land surfaces by evaporation. Right in the middle, find E. Warming of the Earth happens as heat is emitted from the Earth's surface and then intercepted by the cloud covering where some of the heat is re-radiated back down to the surface. When clouds are involved, the balance of heat transfer becomes intermixed as heat is intercepted, reflected, and absorbed. Never discount the role precipitation serves as a medium of heat transfer when evaporating or when raining. This is all a process of energy transfer. What is the difference between radiation and incident radiation? Radiation is a general term for the energy transmitted through space. Incident radiation is a term used when referring to the radiation hitting a specific surface. For instance, the incident radiation for a solar panel is a total amount of solar radiation hitting the panel's face. Become familiar with the term incident solar radiation. In a messy acronym filter, we get the term insulation. This is where it comes from. This contrasts with direct beam radiation, which refers only to that radiation which arrives in a straight line from the sun. With these conditions, we understand how much energy is transferred to plants based on the conditions of where it grows. Convection is the heat transfer due to the bulk movement of molecules within fluids such as gases and liquids, including molten rock. Convection includes sub-mechanisms of advection and diffusion. When a fluid, such as air or liquid, is heated and then travels away from the source, it carries the thermal energy along. This type of heat transfer is called convection. The fluid above the hot surface expands, becomes less dense, and rises. Evapotranspiration is the sum of evaporation and plant transpiration from the Earth's land and ocean surfaces to the atmosphere. Evaporation accounts for the movement of water to the air from the source, such as the soil, canopy interception, and water bodies. Notice the energy budget is in balance. All coming in eventually is cycled out. The Earth receives 174 petawatts of incoming solar radiation. Hmm, that is our insulation measure at the upper atmosphere. Approximately 25% is reflected back to space, while the rest is absorbed by clouds, oceans, and land masses. The spectrum of solar light at the Earth's surface is mostly spread across the visible and near-infrared ranges, with small parts in the near-ultraviolet range. 
Evapotranspiration is the process by which water is transferred from land to the atmosphere by evaporation from soil and other surfaces, and by the transmission from plants. Evapotranspiration is an important process in the water cycle because it is responsible for 15% of the atmosphere's water vapor. Without that input of water vapor, clouds couldn't form, and precipitation would never fall. In naturally occurring forest lands, we see an energy delivery complex cycling from the sun, through the atmosphere, and into plant cells. That is the intake, but energy loss is critical in understanding this process. Albedo is reference to the solar radiation that is referenced by the abiotic surfaces of an area. Everyone who has skied on a bright winter day will know how all the sunlight is reflected by the snow and onto your face. Wow, those are some intense sunburns. Albedo expresses how some surfaces naturally reflect sunlight, sometimes almost all of it. Sensible heat loss is the natural conveyance of energy based on the physical site characteristics. Finally, evapotranspiration is the biotically responsible part of this scenario. Picture the forest with several leaf layers from the surface, through the multiple layers of shrubs and into the stacked layers of tree branches. Each layer has plant cells seeking to photosynthesize. A part of photosynthesis is the release of moisture from the cells. This moisture came to the plant from the ground, through its roots where it packed dissolved nutrients for the plant to grow. Plant transpiration releases this water into the atmosphere, and with its latent heat loss, precipitation results. We have all learned about deforestation as the removal of a naturally occurring forest land. Trees are cut and the site is not reforested. This is deforestation and when it happens, we have a loss of the evapotranspiration component from this balance. At the same time, the albedo was changed from a darkish green forest land cover to bare earth. More sunlight is reflected back into the atmosphere. Sensible heat loss is increased as more energy exits the forest land site before it is used by plants. The clouds got smaller and the amount of moisture cycling into them has reduced. Earth surfaces all play a role in this system. For example, if land vegetation is cleared for deforestation or agricultural burning, the bare surface reflects more sunlight back into space, creating a cooling effect. At the same time, deforestation and biomass burning release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This drop occurs because deforestation reduces the natural recycling of moisture from the soils, through vegetation, and into the atmosphere, from where it would have returned as rainfall. Albedo is important in terms of understanding the energy budget of our planet. Ice has a high albedo, so reflects most solar radiation back into the atmosphere, resulting in the ice remaining cold. Think back to the conditions during the apex of the current ice age, about 18,000 years ago. All the ice and snow reflected direct solar radiation back into space. It was not absorbed. Our planet's albedo was high. Think of this as an energy budget where the ice reflects 99% of the heat it was provided. Thus, the energy is in the atmosphere surrounding it, and it is transferred to other sinks. The most closely sighted sink is the ocean. Vegetation cover alters albedo. For example, albedo of dark colored tropical forest cover is typically less than 15%, thus absorbing high levels of solar radiation. The albedo of lighter colored pasture and cropland is typically in the range of 20 to 30%, slightly greater than unvegetated bare ground, which is always less than 25%. This tells us how much solar radiation is absorbed by plants, instead of being reflected away. I take you now on a trip from Pullman, northerly to the lands near British Columbia, Canada, passing Chewila, Washington. Watch the surface of the earth in these images. There are a bunch of areas with forest land of vegetation, and some with white fields. I am flying into Keystone Quarry, at Carr's Corner. Huckleberry Mountain, Stevens County, Washington, USA. This is a dolomite open pit mine. In anticipation of the importance of the production of metallic magnesium, 
Specific plants were made several years ago for the study of the dolomite and magnesite resources of Washington. Virtually all the dolomite of the state is found in the northeastern part, particularly in Stevens County. Some of the dolomite occurs in formations of Cambrian age, some of those considered to be part of the Precambrian and Triassic ages. Dolomite is used as a source of magnesia, a feed additive for livestock, a sintering agent and flux in metal processing, and as an ingredient in the production of glass, bricks, and ceramics. Dolomite serves as the host rock for many lead, zinc, and copper deposits. These are its human uses, but in nature, it is an extreme albedo reflector. Naturally occurring, it reflects all solar radiation back into the atmosphere. Earth is a spherical body, we know that. The incoming solar radiation beams reaching the outermost atmosphere of Earth arrive in parallel radiation beams. Planetary energy interception is bounded by our rounded shape. Sunray interception is altered by the atmosphere, but generally represents a uniformly distributed source of energy that will interact with Earth's surface. The angle of the Earth's surface receiving the solar radiation differs according to locations on the globe. At the equator, the incoming solar radiation beams are just about perpendicular to the Earth's surface. Thus, the solar radiation is concentrated into smaller area in contrast to the poleward locations. At a location farther toward the pole regions, the angle of the receiving surface is greater and angled away from the sun, so that the same amount of energy that enters the Earth's atmosphere is now intercepted over a larger area, decreasing solar radiation intensity. This means that average annual temperatures generated from solar radiation of global climates will systematically decrease from the equatorial regions to higher latitudes near and at the poles. I keep describing physical environments with consideration of energy transfer. Hmm. Energy needs to come in forms plants can use. Pure energy is needed for photosynthesis, mm, but that is not enough. It needs to warm the water so plants can use it. It needs to enter plants through the roots. Plants are not taking their moisture through the leaves. The warm soil water needs to dissolve nutrients, which plant roots can absorb. The confluence of water, temperature, and light all need to be in balance for plants to succeed. This confluence is put in terms of continentality to understand how these factors rely on the physical environment's temperature in combination with latitude and distance from the nearest ocean body. Continentality is a measure of the difference between continental and marine climates as characterized by the increased range of temperatures that occur over land compared with water. Oceans are large energy sinks, with weather initiating there and spreading into the continents. Pullman's location in terms of the distance to the Pacific Ocean is considered in terms of other factors about this particular place. We put place into context. You start to see locations to consider the importance of where each is located. It may be Alaska, located far to the north, surrounded by cold water oceans. It is North Dakota, in the middle of the continent, adjacent to the Canadian border. In these two simple examples, you can appreciate how different precipitation levels are. That is defined through continentality, latitude, weather systems, and temperatures. Slip to deserts in Arizona to compare with Nevada's ecosystems. These two sites are nearest to neighbors on the map, but the ecosystems observed are strikingly different. Oftentimes, plants and animal community differences pivot on something of a deal breaker. It might be the difference in the weather patterns, geologic foundations, or even mountain ranges changing how cloud cover and precipitation is delivered. Or, in the case of the desert, hmm, how it's not delivered. Take this as representation of how this water cycle is broad and inclusive of water in all forms. Water is one of those necessities of life. It is critical to have water available at a temperature plants can use. Timing is one of the most critical aspects to this theme. Precipitation falling as snow, at negative 10 degrees, is not the same as rainfall coming at 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. Nutrients are dissolved in water first, 
Then, plant roots can take it in. We have discussed biomes and the structures we see to capture understanding about plant communities. Well, now I switch this into a discussion about macroclimates. This is the overall climate of a region, usually a large geographic area, like this one looking at all of North America. We do this to capture consistency at this broad level without stating anything about the plants that grow there. Macroclimate expresses specifics of the dominating climate systems. Huh. Look for Pullman on this scene. We are firmly seated in the marine modified continental macroclimate. The name says a lot about this place on the planet. We use this to describe the terms of the climate faced by organisms living here. This description is broad, just as the macroclimate name implies. How do we use this? Think about climate as being what we expect and the weather is what we get. We come back to this image showing troposphere and stratosphere. I told you we would come back to this. The dividing line between the troposphere and the stratosphere fluctuates. It is not a hard line. The troposphere is where clouds are born and is realized by changing temperatures between these two layers, generally found between 7 and 10 kilometers up. Clouds are the mechanism that filters direct solar radiation, accumulates and carries rain to all areas inland, and builds wind power with the volume of the humidity-rich clouds. I transition this part of the discussion to Dr. Mel Strong for about 15 minutes. Mel is a cat man. The partner he has on his desk is a real kitty. Mel's dedication to these topics is great. I learned more about clouds from Mel than I ever learned in wildfire boot camp training. Hey, Mel, take it away. Hey, how you doing? This is Mel Strong, and this lecture is on how to identify and name clouds. Now, we're not going to talk about the processes that actually form the clouds. That will be in a future lecture. But here what we're doing is we're learning a naming uh, system that was developed by Luke Howard a couple hundred years ago. Luke Howard was a pharmacist, and he just really liked clouds, and he uh, painted paintings of clouds. And then in 1802, he published a classification system, because up to that point, there wasn't one. And his classification system isn't perfect, but it's still in use today, and his cloud names are still in use today. So that's what we're going to learn. And in his system, you need to know two things uh, to name a cloud. You need to know the cloud's shape, and you need to know the cloud's height above the ground. Now. As far as shape goes, all clouds in this system have to fall into one of three possible shapes. Cumuliform, stratiform, and seriform. And I'll show you examples of these shapes in a, in a minute. And then for height, uh, we just have three categories of heights, low, middle, and high. And with those three shapes and those three heights, we come up with 10 different cloud names uh, in this system. So first we're going to go through the shapes. And Cumuliform shape uh, clouds are also known as heap clouds. These are the clouds that are kind of uh, puffy looking, or they might kind of look like cotton or cauliflower, and they might be wider than they are tall, they might be taller than they are wide, they might be just little tiny puffballs, uh, they may be low droopy clouds, but all of these uh, have something in common, which is they all have this kind of puffy edge on them, right? So these are all cumuliform clouds. Now, the stratiform clouds are a lot more boring, and they're uh, sometimes called the layered clouds. They're like these big blankets that cover the sky. And so you don't usually see a lot of features within these clouds. Maybe you can see the sun poking through, maybe not. Uh, but just think of like a big solid gray sky, and that's a stratiform cloud. You usually can't see the edges of these. Then seriform are the clouds that are kind of wispy or curly or hairy. Uh, sometimes they'll, uh, they'll have little hooks on the end, sometimes not. Uh, here's some that have little uh, heads with little uh, feathery trails leading off of them. Uh, these are pretty straight. So there's a lot of varieties in, in seriform clouds. Now, we've talked about the three shapes. Let's talk about the three heights. And in order to understand these, this low, middle, high terminology, we have to explain a little bit how the atmosphere is structured. And so let's imagine that we've got a mountain range here and we were, let's say, to launch 
a balloon up into the air above this mountain range. And on the balloon, we put a temperature sensor so it can tell us what the temperature is, which is what a weather balloon actually does. And so if we had a balloon and we let it launch and we collected all this data as it climbs up into the atmosphere, and then we took all that data, let's just say it's collecting temperature data, and we made a plot, right? And in my plot, I've got an x-axis of temperature, so it's warmer to the right, colder to the left, and I plot uh, height on the y-axis, and I were to plot that data that that balloon measured, my graph would look kind of like this at first. The balloon would notice it's warmest near the surface, and as it goes up into the atmosphere, it cools and cools with height. And that probably makes sense to you because if you go up to the top of a mountain, it's usually colder up there. We'll learn in a later lecture that when the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, it really doesn't interact with it. Uh, it warms the ground and the ground warms the atmosphere from the bottom. But for now, all we have to realize is that this, this trend happens and then at some point, uh, something weird happens. The, our little weather balloon would notice that the air actually starts warming up as it gets, when it gets to a certain point, it continues to warm up as you go higher, okay? Now, in a later lecture, we'll explain more about why this happens, but for now, all we're gonna say is that this little inflection point between where the atmosphere cools with height and when it starts to warm with height, that, that forms a natural boundary between two layers in the atmosphere, and all the air below that line is called the troposphere, and all air above that line is called the stratosphere. So. The reason we're talking about this is this low middle high business that refers to low middle high in this layer in the bottom layer of the atmosphere now the exact height of this varies by season it can vary by day if it's a really cold day it will be lower if it's a hot day it'll be higher if you're in the tropics it's higher if you're near the poles it's lower but kind of a worldwide average is close to seven miles above the ground is where this division is so our low middle high clouds have to fall somewhere between close to the ground level and up to as high as maybe seven miles. So roughly we just divide it like this, low clouds, middle clouds, high clouds. Now there's a problem with this in that we don't have a word for a cloud that's in here or a cloud that's in here. So we kind of have to force clouds to fall into one of these three categories. So like I said, it's not it's not necessarily a perfect system. So the high and mid clouds uh, have a prefix. So if a cloud is up here, we give it a prefix zero. And if a cloud is kind of around here, we give it a prefix alto. And if a cloud is down here, it does not have a prefix. This will make more sense when I give you some examples. Okay, so let's start with one. I have a chemoform cloud and it's low. I call it cumulus, all right? Now I take that puffy cloud and I move it up to kind of the middle of the troposphere. I would call that alto cumulus. It looks smaller, and I'll show you pictures of these in a second, but that alto tells you the mid-level of the atmosphere or the troposphere. If I move that puffy cloud up higher, it'll again appear, appear even smaller and it'll have that prefix zero. You can do the same thing with stratus clouds. It works a little bit differently. So here's a high stratus cloud, a blanket. That would be cirrus stratus. With alto stratus, usually what that means is that that high cloud extends all the way down to the middle of the uh, atmosphere, middle of the troposphere, that's alto stratus. And if it extends down almost to the ground, doesn't have to touch it, but gets low, we'll call that stratus. So again, there's no prefix here. So now let's move up to alto cumulus clouds. So now these are gonna be higher above the ground. So naturally they're gonna appear smaller because they're farther away from us, but the clouds themselves are actually also smaller. And here's some typical alto cumulus. So these are considered mid clouds. So, so now these are not low and these are considerably further up in the atmosphere. You can see how they're smaller. All right, let's go on to cirro cumulus. And because they're so high up, these are little tiny puffy clouds that you can actually kind of see through, right? Like light will shine through cirrocumulus clouds because they're so thin. And, you know, they're tiny because they're far away, but they're also literally very thin clouds. 
So there's a fourth puffy cloud that actually does not exist at just one of these three levels, but in fact can exist at all of those three levels at the same time. It starts out low and it grows up high, and that's called the cumulonimbus. Now a cumulonimbus also has another more popular name, which is thunderstorm, because this nimbus means precipitation. So anytime you have a puffy cloud that is precipitating, whether it be rain or snow, you gotta go with cumulonimbus, even if it's not making any uh, audible thunder or you can see any visible lightning. Just the fact that you have precipitation out of a cumuliform cloud, we're going with cumulonimbus. So here's an example of what is first a cumulus cloud uh, right now, but then notice right there, we're starting to get some precipitation. And in a later lecture, we'll explain why this is happening. But for now, just realize that a cumulus can sometimes turn into a cumulon, uh, cumulonimbus if the conditions are right. So once you see precipitation, you have to go with a cumulonimbus. There's another type of puffy cloud that's kind of a special case. It's called stratocumulus. So if I have one low puffy cloud, I've got cumulus. If I have two low puffy clouds, I would still call them cumulus. But if I have so many puffy clouds that they end up touching each other or almost touching each other, and maybe I can see a little light in between, I'm gonna go with stratocumulus. Stratocumulus is actually the most common cloud type on Earth, but we don't see it that much on land because uh, stratocumulus occurs over the ocean. And we get it once in a while here in New Mexico. So here's some, some stratocumulus. So if I could just pull out one of those blobs, I'd have one single low cumulus cloud. But I have so many of them that you know I can see some light in between and maybe I'll get a glimpse of the sky or maybe not. Um, I'm going to call this stratocumulus. So we've gone through all the cumuliform clouds, and now we're going to go through the stratiform clouds, which are a lot less interesting to look at. We're going to start with stratus, which is a low uh, stratiform cloud. And the key to identifying stratus is that uh, you cannot tell where the sun is. So it's a gray sky, and in this time lapse, the sun is actually right there, but you can't see it. So if you've got a gray sky and you can't point to, to the sun, then you've got stratus, okay? So um, might be light gray, might be dark gray. There might be some texture in the sky. There might not be, but what's consistent is that you can't tell where the sun is. Now, if that gray sky is also producing precipitation, either rain or snow, we're gonna call it nimbostratus. There's only two types of clouds that produce precipitation. Cumulonimbus, which is the puffy one, and nimbostratus, which is the layered one. When we get to the top of the troposphere, we have a very thin layer of cloud that we call cirrus stratus. And not only is this cloud very thin, but because it's so high up, it's actually very cold and it's entirely made of ice crystals. And it turns out that when light shines through a layer of ice crystals, it makes an optical uh, pattern. It makes a circle. And Cirrostratus clouds are characterized by this ring that goes around the sun. Now, the pictures I'm showing you here are not mine. Uh, I have a really hard time getting good pictures of Cirrostratus clouds. And some of these I've been able to track down the source. Some of these are just, they're all over the internet and I can't figure out uh, where they originated from. So I can't give everybody credit. But key is that in a Cirrostratus cloud, uh, you might see the sun as a fuzzy ball, but the key is, look for this ring. And that ring will sometimes have little rainbow colors in it. So for so this is probably the best one I have, where you can kind of see some color in there. Not only do you get a ring around the sun, but you can get a ring around the moon. And this kind of shows you how thin this cloud is. Like You can see stars through it, right? So it, it's even hard to call it a cloud, but we do. It's just this very thin layer of ice crystals where so those are the 10 cloud types as originally outlined by Luke Howard back in 1802. And most of the clouds you will ever see will fit in one of those categories, but there are a few oddballs that don't completely fit. And I'm gonna give you two more. And these two, you actually will see in New Mexico occasionally. So for the first one, here we've got the Sandias and there is wind that's blowing up over the Sandias and for reasons that we'll explain in a later lecture, uh, when air rises, it 
it can form clouds. So there's this little cap of a cloud that sits on the mountain. Okay, now that cap is now grown and it's starting to get this shape that's kind of a disc shaped. And we call these clouds lenticular clouds. Or if I zoom out a little bit more, okay, so this whole thing now is this air mass moving over the mountain is creating this, this disc called a lenticular cloud. Another extra one, here's a cumulonimbus, so that remember that's the thunderstorm. And sometimes what we'll get right on the bottom of a cumulonimbus are these sinking blobs of cold air that come down. And they form kind of a droopy looking cloud that's called mammatus. And these will often happen right before or right after a thunderstorm occurs. So here they are. Each one of those blobs is sinking cold air that's coming down out of this cumulonimbus. Here's some more that are, these are better lit here. So you can see them starting to come down. We got a little precipitation over here, but for the most part, that's those are just blobs of cold air. Here's some good ones forming right there. Okay, so these are all mammatus, these blobs coming down. Okay, so in conclusion, we got 10 cloud types that were originally defined by Luke Howard back in 1802. And on top of that, I'm giving you two others that don't fit very well in that original classification system, lenticular and mammatus. Thank you, Dr. Mel Strong. Mel's full lecture on this topic is about half an hour long, and he gives many photographs and video examples of each cloud type. Keep in mind the life-giving function clouds enable. They are the transport mechanism to deliver precipitation to land. That is how plants get moisture from the soil. When in the soil and the temperatures within the plant's growth range, moisture dissolves elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is also in our atmosphere, but plants cannot use any of it. Plant roots need to pull it from the soil. Without clouds, most land would be dry and inhospitable. There'd be no drinking water and agriculture would be impossible. More to the point, plants and environmental conditions enable wildlife to thrive and survive. These are the primary consumers we know of as herbivores. On this chart, we are looking at precipitation for the Quinault Indian Reservation, Olympic Mountains, along the Pacific Ocean shorelines in Washington. I collected these data while completing environmental assessments about the reservation. I ask you now, is this a report of weather or climate? Hmm, how do we know? If I want the weather report, I will look for the date. Weather happens on a day specifically noted. In this case, I see a range of years, 1971 through 2010. That is the indicator you need to see. This is climate. It was generated from a daily weather data set for 39 years, and that is what gives this report of what has been. When scientists talk about climate, they're looking at averages of precipitation, temperature, humidity, sunshine, wind velocity, phenomena such as fog and frost. These are measures of weather that occur over long periods in a particular place. In this case, I have pushed them into Microsoft Excel to calculate the monthly min, max, and created an average. We see some interesting trends when we look at the data like this. Same location, different view. I generated these raster database features in ArcGIS and trimmed them to match the spatial extent of the reservation. Now a different way of looking through this telescope. Still in ArcGIS, I view the raster data to show temperature. I revealed the warmest average monthly temperature norm. In this case, it is August. You can see on the key how the highest recorded average monthly temperature was 75 degrees Fahrenheit, seen near Lake Quinault in the northeastern range of the reservation. In this average of August temperatures, the lowest of this series was 62 degrees, and that was found along the Pacific Ocean shorelines. Because PRISM databases have a spatial component embedded in them, the predictive forces of the databases extend to the temporal foundation by spanning time through years, decades, and even to the level of a century. This is formidable expression of spatial and temporal data extended into the GIS platform. On this map view, we see the coldest average month on the reservation, January. 
This time, the Pacific Ocean shoreline holds the warmest temperatures at 35 degrees, while the coldest parts are slightly north of Lake Quinault. This is climate, and you know it because you see the years of data collection used, and the title showing what is relayed. Now take a view from Mount June over the proposed Hardesty Wilderness Area to the Three Sisters and Mount Bachelor in the Cascade Mountains, Oregon. What data do you see? Okay, there's a temperature, precipitation, and relative humidity. Hmm, this looks a lot like a report of weather on June 15, at high noon. We stay on Mount June looking at a chart with months on the x-axis and two y-axes. One with temperature and the other with precipitation. Lines of temperature and precipitation give us the big message. But that range of dates in the title gave us the confirmation. This 1946 through 2013 trend is all you need to know. This is climate. Climate reports statistics, usually mean or variability of weather. We like longish data set reports, some reaching over a hundred years. But when we have those, we can bifurcate data into segments to show climatological changes between periods. This is how climate change is sometimes stated. We use databases of daily or monthly information to create monthly and annual averages through time. This is how PRISM data has been assembled, with new data added continuously through time. We can report these as figures, charts, tables, or geospatial analysis maps. Each presentation gives the analyst unique means to share the vision. Again to the map view, showing mean annual temperature. This is climate, taken from a time series which is not shown here. It would only be weather if it shows that these are the days recorded in min or max. Watch out for this. Many times you will see data reported like this. Not putting the range of years the data came from is sloppy. Be good to yourself. Make sure not to make it like that. If you want to make these data from geospatial datasets, then look to PRISM data. Fire up your raster-enabled GIS program to load these data. PRISM has these records, and more. Investigative research is required to make these data useful. When analyzed through a GIS system, data specific to geographical areas can be found. You will make graphs, maps, and analyze data for the area you want to explore. This is your decision to use all the tools you have at your disposal. Here, you can make it happen. Database values are associated with specific locations on Earth. These are drilled into the level of 4 kilometer cells. If you are a GIS wonk, you will be saying right now that we think of 30 meter cells as sloppy because we get 1 meter LiDAR data these days. Well, that is meaningful when examining elevation data. But this is about climate, and we may have weather collection stations separated by dozens or hundreds of miles. So, 4 kilometers is outstanding. Skip over to the Explorer tab. Navigate around this continent. Find Kamiak Butte. You know it is north of Pullman. See the cells on this screen and click on one in the middle of the butte. Now, scan the metadata about the available dataset. Wow, location looks right. The starting year is outstanding, reaching all the way back to 1895. The default settings are presenting us with annual values. Okay, those have purpose, but I want to see monthly values. Select that radio button. I like to summarize my data with the specific records instead of trying to parse it up. Click on the Retrieve Time Series to see an on-screen stack of bar and line charts for these data. Huh, okay, that looks impressive, but I cannot use that in my written document. Slip back to the Download Time Series. That's the ticket. For this one, it will download a CSV file to your computer. Now the data are under your control. Download it and open in Microsoft Excel. If you have done this before, you can get on to drilling into the data and find numerical summaries and make some graphs. If you want to see an example of this whole process, open the associated video and we'll do it together. When you write up this climate report, Make it a standalone document about the climate of Kamiak Butte. Describe the climate using all available measures. 
These discussions will integrate with all other aspects of the master report you prepare. Make this document a solid report about climate.